and when you talk about environmental justice, they think it's black environment. No, 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 no. You got to deal with the issue of civil rights and tying the environment into laws and inequalities. And this is why the democracy piece is very critical. When you take a civil right, it's not just black rights or Hispanic rights or Native American rights. You extrapolate that to the whole population. So that means that even by pursuing justice for us, you pursue justice for all. What is environmental justice? And how is environmental justice related to democracy and to systemic racism in the United States? Aaron Mayer is a leader in the environmental justice movement and a former president of the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club was founded in 1892 and became one of the largest and most influential environmental organizations in the U.S. In 2015, Aaron Mayer became the Sierra Club's first Black president. He first engaged issues of environmental justice in the late 1980s when he moved to Arbor Hill, a majority Black neighborhood in Albany, New York, along with his wife and children. It's like it, you couldn't make it any more ideal. So you had the history of a walkable community, an old historic community. There's the mansion and all these other attractions. And, you know, I could walk to work and uh, it would be perfect. So if my wife ended up with a teaching job there, it would have been excellent. Um, we, when we were living at uh, uh, 123 Lark, uh, we noticed the Answers Incinerator. ANSWERS stands for the Albany, New York Solid Waste to Energy Recovery System. It was a solid waste incinerator that burned garbage to produce electricity for the Empire State Plaza, where Aaron Mayer worked. However, it also produced a toxic ash that blew directly over Aaron Mayer's family and his home in Arbor Hill. The issue is that while this was a desired good, the issue is where you put this negative amenity, you know, and that negative amenity was cited in the uh, African-American community. So all of the Capitol Hill complexes, the governor's mansions, the legislature, all the state courts, uh, all the apparatus that ran the most sophisticated and advanced state in the union, uh, if not the eastern seaboard, you know, was coming from burning garbage in a black community. So the early stages that I noticed was the issue of soot. You know, I did not pay attention to the impacts on health because at that time I was worried about settling my family and we were worrying about getting a job. Dr. Robert D. Bullard is a sociologist and activist who has researched and written several books on environmental justice. In his 1990 book, Dumping in Dixie, Dr. Bullard wrote how polluted black communities is not a new phenomenon. Historically, toxic dumpings have followed the path of least resistance, meaning that black and poor communities have been disproportionately burdened with these types of externalities. So right about this time, you know, uh, you know, a study comes out called Toxic Waste and Race. It came out in 87, but it hit like a, a bomb. And this is where it's linking the fact that, you know, polluting facilities, environmental facilities are being located and sited in urban communities. And regardless of your socioeconomic status, they went back in time and found even these old black communities were built on top of landfills like in Jacksonville, Florida. This is the first systematic analysis of how governments at all levels, from the federal all the way down to the local, handles uh, hazardous waste, solid waste, polluting facilities, sewage treatment plants, all these things, whether we call them negative amenities, things that are essential for cities, how they deal and manage their waste, how they deal and manage their sewage. These things, in the process of dealing with these things, they produce a lot of toxins and toxic byproducts. They produce a lot of odors. But more importantly, the dust and particulates can not only produce, trigger asthma, in some cases, depending upon the composition, can be carcinogenic. Studies have shown how communities of color suffer significantly worse health effects than their white counterparts because of their disproportionate exposure to these environmental toxins. Communities of color have shorter life expectancies, higher cancer rates, more birth defects, more heart diseases, and other racialized health disparities. Dr. Benjamin Chavis, Charles Lee, and Bernice Miller Travis, they were part of the pioneering effort on the United Church of Christ, supported by the United Church of Christ, that did the analysis that showed that these conditions 
of you know of the grimy durban dirty urban community was actually a function of actual land use policy linked to our governments linked to our faulty or failing democracy or democracies that did not treat people of color equally under the law hence creating injustices in this case environmental justice and since it's codified and classified by race it falls along the fault lines of race uh, Ben Chaps properly called it environmental racism. In the book Confronting Environmental Racism, Dr. Chavez defines environmental racism as the racial discrimination in the deliberated targeting of ethnic and minority communities for exposure to toxic and hazardous waste sites and facilities, coupled with the systematic exclusion of minorities in environmental policy making, enforcement, and remediation. So these things start to come together and you say, my God, you know, the, 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 the civil rights struggle is not just fighting for voting rights and not just fighting for jobs for blacks or fighting for, for this is literally totally systemic. What you find is that this is another area in which uh, the dynamics of racism plays out. So in the case of discretionary choices to where you're going to put a hazardous landfill or where you're going to site a, a very dangerous uh, production facility. And in this case, you know, new energy by burning garbage at the answers plant, you site these things right within a minority community. We're experiencing direct exposure. We're having the particulates on our cars. I buy a home and I'm in the prevailing wind pattern this point of this of this incinerator. So all at the same time, uh, I am actually seeing. Following his epiphany, Mayor began a decade-long battle to shut down the incinerator, rallying members of his community into unified action to protect their collective health and well-being. Environmental rights and environmental justice is a function of our civil society and a healthy democracy. There was not an arbitrariness to pollution and environmental degradation. There's, a, there's actually some very deliberate aspects, but more importantly, these aspects of pollution and environmental degradation fell along the civil rights fault line in America. They fell along the racial fault line in America, and it made sense because political decision making that also fell on racial fault lines would dictate that those legislators, those rule makers, those policy makers would rule and legislate in a way that would disadvantage minorities, Native Americans, Hispanics and blacks and advantage whites.